Today we're going to make a wholemeal spelt black treacle yeasted bread. Great thing with this one, we're working with some wholemeal spelt flour and we're just going to give a little bit of sweetness to it today using a little bit of black treacle. So with this recipe, we're going to be using some fresh yeast. Don't get too hung up on fresh versus dried. A lot of it kind of comes down to what you've access to and tradition. First time I ever made bread was at fresh yeast, that's what I tend to use. Dried yeast is much more concentrated, so you use less of it. So if you're using about 20 grams of fresh, it'd be about seven grams of dried. Fresh yeast will only keep for about two to three weeks and you keep it in the fridge. Um, and I dried yeast, which will keep for seven months, which is kind of much more in line with the home baker, where you might only bake every now and again. So most recipes will always suggest that you must dissolve the yeast in some water with a spoonful of sugar. That's an absolute myth, um, because refined sugar is too complex for yeast to feed off. It does not eat it. Sugar is generally only added to bread for flavor and for color to help caramelize the crust. So with people being quite health conscious and being sugar levels, if you don't want to add it, simply don't add it. In an ideal world, we'd simply just dissolve our yeast in the liquid. But if you're ever making bread and you've added in all the wet ingredients and you realize you haven't added your yeast yet, don't worry, just crumble it straight in. It'll work absolutely fine. So as always, when it comes to bread making, always mix your salt through your flour. So we got 700 grams of wholemeal spelt flour and we're adding two teaspoons of, of salt, which is about 10 grams. If you cook without salt, your food is generally pretty bland. A little bit of salt heightens the flavor of everything else. Same applies to bread, it heightens the flavor within our flour. As I say, we're gonna use some black treacle. Generous tablespoon. If you don't have black treacle, you could quite happily use a little bit of honey, maybe some molasses. Just adds a lovely kind of malted sweetness to our bread, which goes great with the wholemeal flour. Or alternatively, if you don't want to add it, depending on your own flavor profile, don't add it at all. And then we're gonna add 510 milliliters of water. And again, you can pour that straight in. And just to show you that you don't have to dissolve the yeast in the water, we've got a little 15 grams of fresh yeast and we're simply just gonna crumble it straight in. Once our ingredients are all in, very, very simply, start bringing everything together. This is gonna be a softer, wetter dough. So if you kind of find your dough quite wet, quite sticky, don't worry, that's exactly what we're looking for. So once your ingredients roughly come together, Simply just turn it straight out on the table. Gluten is a basic protein, and gluten forms in flour once it becomes hydrated. So at the moment, the gluten is quite weak. We need to build up the elasticity and the strength of our dough, and we do so by kneading. And the idea of kneading is you simply to stretch and work the dough. Again, you can see that the dough is a little bit wet, it's a little bit sticky. Generally, everyone's reaction at home is to immediately reach for some flour. The thing is, if you keep adding flour, the dough will quite happily soak it up, and then the, the dough just becomes heavier and heavier, and in result, the heavier your bread will be. So just stick with it, you need to be persistent. So when it comes to kneading, I'm simply just using the palm of my hand, a little short stretch, and I'm pinning the dough between here and here. Then you're stretching and hooking it back. Great thing about working with spelt, say, versus, say, our common wheat. Spelt actually requires less work to be come together. So you actually tend to underwork it slightly. Where kind of generally your kneading time is about eight to 10 minutes. You generally find with spelt, it needs less time to come together. So already you can see the dough changing. It's not gonna dry out, but it's certainly gonna become much more elastic, much stretchier, and that's exactly what we're looking for. Now, if you do have a, a mixer, a KitchenAid, or Kenwood, feel free to use it. The dough hook's gonna do exactly the same thing that your hands are doing. So with this dough, because it's a little bit wet, and because spelt ha does have a tendency to kind of flow and spread a little bit out, particularly as it proves and as it bakes, we're gonna adopt a slightly different technique with this dough. So once it's kind of, you can see it's roughly got together, it's not perfectly smooth yet but it's kind of at the point where we want it to be. I'm simply just gonna pop it back into my bowl and we're gonna leave it rest for about 20 to 30 minutes. So then after 20 or 30 minutes, so we're simply gonna take the dough, dump it straight out onto the table and we're gonna incorporate a stretch and a fold. So a bit like an envelope, it's folded from the top into the middle, fold the bottom over and left to right. So it's gonna be popped up back into our bowl. Again, we let it proof again for about 30 minutes. 
So just for those of you that might not be familiar with spelt, or you've heard the name, or you might have tasted it, or you might have tried it, spelt is wheat. Um, it's packed full of gluten. You get a lot of misconceptions about it, that it's gluten-free, it's, it's not wheat, if people have wheat intolerances, they can have spelt, which, yeah, which is often the case that they can. But the, the, it is wheat, it's a much more primitive grain. It's one of the ancient grains. So you generally find people who do tend to struggle with a little bit of wheat and gluten, particularly with the over-processed flours, they find spelt much easier to digest. So this chemical structure is a little bit simpler. But you're gonna find it treated exactly the same way as you would your regular strong flour or your wholemeal flour. It works absolutely great. And it's just really packed full of flavor. So a really lovely flour to work with. Our dough has been resting for the last 30 minutes. So we didn't work it a huge amount to begin with. Because the idea is we're working with a softer weather dough. So we wanna stretch it out. So by letting it rest, it allows the gluten to relax. Your dough then is much more elastic. So all we're simply doing is folding it straight over, top to bottom, left to right. And simply going straight back into your bowl again. And then we're gonna let it prove for about an hour. At which time we're looking at, you feel our dough. So you can see it, it's lovely and lively, nice little strength to it. So it's perfectly ready to be knocked back. Because as the dough is proving, the internal temperature is much higher than the external temperature. So by knocking it back, we simply knock the air from it. We equalize that temperature. So we stop the cycle and we start a new one. Because as much as we say the longer we prove bread, the better, you can overprove it. So by knocking it back, again, all you're doing is trying to flatten the air from it. Taking all your ledges, bring it back together. So once our dough has been knocked back, it's ready to be portioned and to be shaped. So this amount of dough is going to give you two loaves. So you're looking at about 600 to 650 grams each. So if you're not used to portioning dough, feel free to use the weighing scales. Um, just have you a little bit more accuracy and you know exactly kind of how much each dough is going to weigh. We're going to do one straight in a tin and then we're going to pop one into our little proving baskets. Just with the tin, I've just brushed it with a little bit of melted butter and then I'm simply going to dust it with a little bit of flour which is just to stop the dough from sticking. You can feel free to line with a little bit of parchment paper depending what condition your own tin is in. This old tin has been around for a while, a bit like myself, but still works great. So then we got our little proving baskets, and then just to stop them from sticking, we're just dusting them with a little bit of flour. So now we need to shape one loaf round. So simply just turn it straight over. Take all your little edges, each one overlapping the last. Round and round it goes. You can see you started the curve round. And again, I'm not using too much flour because the idea is I need the dough to grip the table. If you find your dough a little bit soft, a little bit sticky, feel free to just use a little bit of flour on your hands. So simply then, with your fingers pointing out, you're dragging the dough towards you. It will try to rise up, turn it 90 degrees, keep the seam to the base, and repeat. And each time you'll feel the surface of the dough tightening. And the idea by having the dough nice and tight, it means then it'll rise with much more control. Let it roll around. And then for our little basket, it's simply going straight in, upside down. A little dusty flour on top, a little proof. Then for our little loaf tin, same thing again. Everything begins from a round base. And from there, we can manipulate it, change it, shape it any way we like. So once we kind of got the rough round, turn it over. Take either edge, you're not ripping it, just stretch out slowly, fold it, one into the center, pin it down a bit like an envelope, you fold it from the bottom in towards the center, just seal it down, you're not digging your fingers in, just seal it down, you keep continuing to roll over, tucking it back in on itself, and roll it straight up, and that simply goes into our tin, seam side facing to the bottom, a little dusty flour on top of each, and again, we'll leave them to prove. So just depending on the conditions of how kind of warm your dough is or how warm your kitchen is, you're looking at about maybe 50 minutes to an hour. If you find that your dough is a little bit colder and it's proven a little bit slower, don't be afraid to give it an extra 15, 20 minutes. So you can see that they're grown nicely. And the idea of generally all your breads, you only ever want to prove them 80%. The idea is the last 20 will come in the oven. It's called the oven spring. So the idea is your dough should have a nice little bounce. 
There's no fear of it touching it and it's going to collapse. If you kind of touch it and you felt that the whole thing is going to sink, you've overproved it. So the idea is you should kind of, you want to catch it on the rise. So it hits the heat and it jumps. Most professional ovens are fitted with steam. The idea being for the first eight to 10 minutes of your bake, your dough is still rising. So because if you were to bake this in a really dry heat, there's a good chance the crust would form before the dough has finished rising. And what can often happen is the dough it forms the crust, it gets trapped in, and then the dough simply can't break through or else you get this big bulge out the side. So by having steam in the oven, it allows it to continue to rise and to open up within the oven. So a great way in which to create steam at home, I've simply got a roasting tray preheated, basically just been in the oven since I turned it on, so it's red hot. Pop my dough in. Now I've got a boiling kettle of hot water. Which is going to help to create that glass of steam that I want in the oven. And that bread is going to bake for 35 minutes. So another great way in which to bake bread at home, no matter how kind of crappy your oven is, is to actually use like a casserole dish. Um, this is simply all it is. I'm pretty sure everyone's got one kind of kick around at home. Um, this one's just made out of Pyrex, made out of glass, um, it's designed for the oven, but you could use anything, an earthware and one. It's just something that's gonna maintain the heat. Take a little bit of dust in the flour, just so it doesn't stick to the lid. So I've taken the lid of the casserole dish, I'm gonna pop it literally, pop up our bread, and we're gonna turn it upside down. So with this one, we're actually going to score it. So when we're scoring, we use a razor blade. Things to remember, it's not a bread knife. You need to actually slash. It can be a little bit daunting to use a blade, but just be nice and confident. Don't be afraid to cut into your dough. And now with this case, simply all I'm doing is taking the dome of a casserole dish, popping it straight on top. I don't actually have to steam my oven this time. It creates its own little chamber within the dish and kind of self-steams the dough. So our baking time will be a little bit longer just because it takes a little bit longer to get the heat through. But again, at 230 degrees. Okay, so our bread has been baking for the last 35 minutes. So you can see it's got that lovely little jump to it. That lovely dome finish. So we literally went before we ended up, it would start about here. So it hits the heat and it jumps. So that's what gives that lovely domed finish to it. So that's our beautiful 100% wholemeal spelt and black treacle Easter bread. And then this one, we're just going to give an extra five or 10 minutes just without the dish, just to help bake in that crust. And it's in the crust where it's all that lovely, beautiful flavor. And straight out. And you can see we got our two beautiful wholemeal spelt loaves with black treacle, light as a feather. Because you get a lot of wholemeal breads that are quite heavy, quite dense, but that's the whole benefit of working with those wetter, softer doughs. And despite the fact that they're exact same weight, exact same dough, they look like two different breads completely. So it's just a few different ways in which we can shape it. So we're gonna let these cool before we cut it. Through. 